Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Big Questions Podcast. I'm so glad you tuned in. Let's definitely pray together as we get started, and then we'll dig into our question. Would you pray with me? God, our Father, thank you, as always, for who you are, first and foremost. Our loving, perfect, awesome, holy creator and sustainer of the universe, king of the universe, on your throne, dwelling in unapproachable light, who we can call Father, Abba, Daddy, because of what you've done for us through Jesus, his cross, the cross, and his resurrection. Father, help us get your heart on this. Help us get your perspective on it. Please give us ears that hear, eyes that see, open our ears, our minds, our hearts. Help us be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Help us get your heart on this. And please, Father God, protect this time. Um, I pray as well. In the Lord Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, one topic that I've been thinking about a lot lately, um, even before the recent news about it, you know, in the media, is a topic of abortion. And to be clear, this podcast topic would have happened anyway, God willing, regardless of the news that came out. This was on our schedule anyway, so it just happened that this is hitting when it did after the news uh, recently in the media. But, uh, you know, abortion is a topic that I realize I've never directly taught an entire like sermon or study on in the 11 plus years that SEC has been going. I've never done like a dedicated uh, sermon just to this topic. So I want to do that this week on this podcast so that it is covered and so that it's recorded so that anyone who wants to to check it out um, from here onward can do so. So what is our official stance on abortion at SCC? Um, Well, the short answer is it's the same stance as with any other topic. Um, As followers of Jesus, our goal is to follow Jesus and to stand where he does on things uh, based on a plain reading of Scripture. Uh, Because as followers of Jesus who have given control of our lives to him, where we stand on any issue now is never about my own opinion or my own desires. No, no. As Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 talk about, you know, because of what Jesus has done for us to save us through the cross and the resurrection— Our goal now is to put our own selfish side aside and instead to live for Jesus and what he wants and do what Jesus does and even think about things like Jesus thinks about them the best that we can with his help, all out of love for him. It just makes sense to live your life like that after all Jesus has done for us, Romans 12 says. So that's what we're after at SCC. And when it comes to the topic of abortion, like any other topic. Here's what the Apostle John says about Jesus in chapter 1, verse 14 of John's biography of Jesus. Listen to this. John said that, quote, Jesus came from God the Father, full of grace and truth. There it is, right? Where does Jesus stand on abortion or any other topic? Simple. He stands with grace and truth, both of those together. So let's look at those in terms of abortion. Well, let's actually look at truth first. What is the truth when it comes to abortion? Um, more, more specifically, in terms of the, the word that John uses there in the Greek language, he originally wrote that in, what is the content of what is true in accordance with what actually happens with abortion? I mean, obviously, the simplest definition of abortion itself is, quote, the termination of a pregnancy by removal or expulsion of an embryo or fetus, um, according to Wikipedia anyway. But, but I assume we can all agree that's a concise, accurate definition. Abortion is the termination of a pregnancy by removal or expulsion of an embryo or fetus. But if we're seeking the truth about abortion, like, like in the context of this podcast, then for me at least, that definition uh, begs some questions, right? It begs the question of, okay, well, what is the truth about everything that mentions? What is the truth about an embryo or a fetus? Um, what's the truth about them scientifically and theologically? Uh, tell me more, right? And, and as far as science goes, you know, the science of embryology has shown us some important truths about 
things like embryos and fetuses, right? I mean, our technology, our understanding today is, is, is pretty cool. If you read some stuff about this, as it says in a textbook called Before We Are Born, Essentials of Embryology, listen to this, quote, embryology is concerned with the origin and development of a human being from zygote to birth. Isn't that interesting? It refers to it as a human being from zygote to birth. As a medical textbook called The Developing Human says on page 11, quote, human development begins at fertilization. This highly specialized totipotent cell marks the beginning of each of us as a unique individual, end quote. So, so as apologist Tim Barnett says so well, quote, the science of embryology actually teaches that from the earliest stages of development, the unborn are distinct, living, whole human beings. You didn't come from an embryo. You once were an embryo. Let that part sink in. I'll say that again. You didn't come from an embryo. You once were that embryo, right? And the only differences between the embryo you once were and the adult you are now, the only differences are size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency. But that embryo is still you. Hmm. End quote, right? I added a little at the end there, but that was the quote for the most part. So according to just the science of embryology, one unbiased truth about abortion is that whenever an abortion occurs, the termination of that pregnancy is ending a human life, right? Based just on what science says. Because according to science and just science, the truth is that human life begins at conception, straight from medical books, right? Though certainly the Bible would agree with that theologically too. Um, I mean, listen to what a medical doctor named Luke wrote in chapter one of his biography of Jesus' life here. Um, a lot of us may know this passage as part of the Christmas story, but I want to challenge you to listen to this with fresh ears, uh, specifically in terms of our topic for today on this podcast, okay? And notice something huge in this passage here. We'll start in verse 26 from Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Dr. Luke, remember Dr. Luke, says, quote, in the sixth month of her cousin Elizabeth's pregnancy, remember that, it's the sixth month, the second trimester of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. Again, remember that, sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Watch this now. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed, this child you, blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. End quote. Okay. Did you catch what just happened there and what that tells us in terms of our question for today? From the perspective of the Bible, in a chapter that was written by a medical doctor in the first century, the point when a human life clearly begins is conception, right? It just recorded a pre-birth interaction between Jesus and John the Baptist, right? Where, where John the Baptist is in the presence of Jesus and he leaps for joy, okay? All while John is what? Still just a second trimester fetus. And Jesus is a first trimester embryo, right? 
if that. I mean, it didn't technically say necessarily she was pregnant yet, but uh, even if even if Jesus wasn't yet being formed, you still have John, second trimester, leaps for joy. Dr. Luke in the Bible makes it clear that both John and Jesus would have been living human beings at the point in their development, whether it was second trimester, first trimester, just happened, right? Which theologically then also means that from the moment of conception, a human life is a big deal to God. Because as the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, all human life is made in God's image, right? Human life is the only thing in all of creation that is made in God's image, according to Genesis 1. And God takes that very seriously. In fact, just a few chapters later in Genesis 9, you see how seriously he takes that in verses 5 and 6. After the story of Noah and the flood, God tells Noah, quote, I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die. And anyone who murders a fellow human must die. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. Why? He goes on, for God made human beings in his own image. It is a huge, sacred thing to be made in the image of God. And the Bible is clear across numerous passages that human life is something God values from the moment of conception. Consider what the ancient Jewish King David wrote in Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. Listen to this here. He's talking to God, and he says, quote, For you created my inmost being, you knit me together, in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Hmm. Speaking of that, by the way, God also told the ancient prophet uh, Jeremiah, the ancient Hebrew prophet, that, quote, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. That's from Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Hmm. So as far as the truth about abortion goes, both science and theology together would tell us some important things, right? They would tell us that abortion at any point in a pregnancy is ending the life of a human being. A human being that is made in God's image, which is a big deal. A human being who has a purpose, who who God has a plan for. So clearly, the truth is about abortion is that it's morally wrong, regardless of what angle you look at it from. Whether you look at it from a science angle, a philosophy angle, or a theological angle like we do as followers of Jesus. Clearly, abortion is morally wrong. How could it not be? I mean, you tell me. Uh, For those of you watching this episode on YouTube, look at this photo I'm putting on the screen here. This is a photograph of a nine-week-old baby. And if you're listening to this on iTunes, maybe just Google nine-week-old baby photo or something like that. I got this actually from a pregnancy website that that's like meant to coach women through their pregnancy. Here's what your baby looks like at nine weeks and what's going on. Look at this picture or find a picture and look at it. And you tell me, that baby at nine weeks that has those little eyes there, right? (laughs) This baby has feet and hands with, with toes and fingers. That's a baby at nine weeks. You tell me, at what point is it morally acceptable to kill that baby? Right? Or, or let's go a step further. What would be the best way to kill that life? I mean, as you may know, abortions often crush the head and rip apart the limbs and then suck it out of the womb uh, with a vacuum of sorts. Usually, as the baby visibly tries to get away from all that, if you watch the ultrasounds, but the baby can't escape, of course. But I mean, maybe there's a better way to murder that baby, yeah? Can we think of one? Oh, Matt, how could you even ask a question like that, you might say? And that's actually my point. How could we ask a question like that? Because even asking that question bothers your conscience, doesn't it? Because we know abortion is wrong to the depths of our soul, especially as followers of Christ. 
We've always known it was wrong. Back to the very beginning of the church. I mean, if you, if you don't know this, abortion is nothing new. It existed back in the first century Roman Empire, too. And in the early church document that we have called the Didache, it's, it's not in the Bible. Um, it was written probably late first century, early second century, kind of as a handbook for how they did church back then. In that book, it actually lists abortion as something that was a, quote, grave sin that was forbidden. Uh, a sin that violated the second commandment, uh, the second greatest commandment of love your neighbor as yourself. Right? As it says in chapter 2 of the Didache, quote, you shall not murder a child by abortion, nor kill that which is born, end quote. Which, if you know your Old Testament, I mean, child sacrifice was a thing a lot of people did throughout ancient times as part of worshiping certain idols. And God had a lot to say about that throughout Scripture. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, when, when God is talking about this list of sins of why, He's going to judge these certain people groups and, and have, have them completely destroyed. Child sacrifice is one of the reasons, one of the sins they were committing. One of the reasons why he was going to judge these cultures. Because they were sacrificing their children by burning them alive to these idols. And they weren't repenting and God couldn't take it anymore. And later on when God's own people started acting like those cultures had, well, here's how Psalm 106 sums it up in verses 34 through 40. Listen, it says, quote, The Israelites did not destroy the peoples as the Lord had commanded them, but they mingled with the nations and adopted their customs. They worshipped their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to false gods. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was desecrated by their blood. They defiled themselves by what they did. By their deeds, they prostituted themselves. Therefore, the Lord was angry with his people and abhorred his inheritance. And if you read on in the psalm and or you know the, the history, God actually allowed the entire nation of Jewish people to be conquered by the Assyrians and the Babylonians as basically a, a massive countrywide discipline for the ways they were sinning, like with this child sacrifice, this burning their children to idols. So just know, it's a big deal to God. And lest we're tempted as followers of Jesus to, to go with that modern slogan of, well, but, you know, it's my body, my choice. Well, can I just remind you what 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 tell us as followers of Jesus, right? For, for people who've put our trust in Jesus, at least, it says, quote, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have received from God. Listen to this. You are not your own. You were bought at a price, right? You were bought with Jesus' life. Therefore, honor God with your bodies, end quote. Scripture actually says, if you've put your trust in Christ, it's not your body, your choice on a lot of things. <laughs> you belong to him. It's his choice. So, for a follower of Jesus, at least, the truth about abortion is that it is a grave evil that should never happen. It is something God hates and clearly feels very strongly about. It is murdering a life that is made in God's image that he has a purpose and a plan for, regardless of the circumstances that led to the conception, I might add. And for thousands of years, God has called his followers to, quote, speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Proverbs 31.8. God's called us to, quote, rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. Save them as they stagger to their death. Don't excuse yourself by saying, look, we didn't know. For God understands all hearts and he sees you. He who guards your soul knows you knew. He will repay all people as their actions deserve. That's Proverbs 24.11 and 12. So, as a church, we take the perspective God took, and we do what we can toward that as a church. We pray, right? We love. We, we talk with people when we can. We give to our local Compassion Pregnancy Center here in Monterey. We support moms who need support however we can. Okay, Matt, you might say, but what if I have already had an abortion? Or what if I caused an abortion in some way? Well, that's where the other half of the equation comes in. The grace part. Remember, Jesus is full of truth and grace. Here's the grace part. 
Because as truly serious and awful as abortion is in God's sight, as much as he hates abortion, he doesn't hate people who've had abortions. He still loves you. And, and while according to Genesis, technically a person should die for murdering a baby, God loves you so much he actually offered a substitute for that death 2,000 years ago when his son, Jesus Christ, died for you on the cross in your place so you don't have to, J- just like he died for me for all the things I deserve death and hell for that I've done. Right? Jesus died for us, not just to save us from physical death, though, to, to save us from eternal death as well. <laughs> to save us from the hell we deserve for our crimes against God. And three days later, Jesus beat death and rose from the grave to prove it was true. And the Bible is beyond clear that if we will come to God and confess what we've done and ask him to forgive us, he will. And he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9 says. He'll give us eternal life because of what Jesus did for us through the cross and resurrection. And just like a woman Jesus talks to in chapter 8 of John's gospel, who had sinned pretty terribly, Jesus will say to us, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. Right? You're forgiven, but no more of this. From here on, we don't do this again. And, and he's promised that if we'll come to him, he will never turn us away. If you'll come to him for forgiveness and eternal life, he will never turn away anyone who comes to him. It's a promise he makes because he's full of grace and truth. And as a church trying to follow him, please know we won't turn away from you either. Right? And if you ever find yourself struggling after having had an abortion, please know we're here for you and we will help in any way that we can. Okay, Matt, you might say, but what about fill in the blank, right? Because there are so many objections and opinions and questions and arguments out there about abortion that there's no way I can cover them all in one podcast episode. But I am including a bunch of links to other videos that I'd recommend in the description below in hopes that those might help with some of the other objections you've heard or, or even objections you have, right? I'm also including a link to the film Unplanned that you can watch 100% for free. You just got to deal with some commercials um, on Redbox, actually. Uh, If you haven't heard of Unplanned, it's the true story of Abby Johnson, who was a director of a Planned Parenthood and uh, very suddenly changed her mind and became one of the most pro-life people you'll ever meet. And the movie tells you why and what it was that happened, and I highly recommend it. It is rated R, just full disclosure, as a heads up, but I definitely recommend it. It is worth a watch. I'm also including a link to our local pregnancy center here in Monterey um, in case you or someone you know may need their services. It's all 100% free. Uh, You can check their website out. They list everything they have, and um, I can't recommend them highly enough. Debbie and Kelly, who run it, are two of the most fantastic people I've ever met, and uh, there's a reason we support them as a church. And I have a link on there to peacewithgod.net for any of you who are finding yourselves needing that forgiveness of Jesus, please click that link, read what it says, watch the videos, and uh, and it'll help. And if you have a question you'd like us to tackle on this podcast, please email it to me. Send it to office at seasidechurchonline.org. Again, that's office at seasidechurchonline.org. And God willing, we'll plan to see you again next time.